Well, good morning, everyone. Today we are looking at Psalm 63. So if you um, would like to run and get your Bible right now so you can follow along, that would be great. Otherwise, I hope you listened carefully to Paul and Lynn. Uh, next week, Pastor Michael will be starting a series on Daniel, where we'll be exploring different themes of being in exile and making connections with our current situation as we continue to walk through this pandemic. Um, in a foreign land, yearning for the time we can return to gathering and worshiping as we used to do. But let's pause for a moment and check in. How are you doing? How are you managing in this season of Zoom, of restrictions and of masks? How are you doing with God? I guess you're doing all right because you're here. But I want to go into a little bit deeper today about how you are doing with God, how I'm doing with God. I really appreciate what Brian Bueller said a couple weeks ago and what Yuri brought to us in his message last week. In Psalm 73, Brian reminded us that it is in the gathering as the body of Christ in the worship service on Sundays, week after week, that includes Zoom, by the way, that our faith grows and we see things as they really are from God's perspective. Last week, Yuri looked at Psalm 27 and highlighted one, the one thing that God asked for and sought, or that David asked for and sought after, that he could dwell in the house of the Lord, gazing at his beauty and seeking him in his temple. And as I reflected on these messages, I thought about what is it that sustains me or will sustain me over the next months? as we weather this time of change and, con and constraints. And what I heard God saying loud and clear is that I need to seek God alone and in, and in the company of other believers so that I may continue to grow deeper with God in these days and that I might shine in order to draw others around me into that light. So today I'd like to pick up some of these themes as we look at Psalm 63. And let's pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us in that. So let's just take a moment to pray. Oh God, you are our God. And as we look into your word today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and illuminate your word. That you would use the words I say and that you would speak directly into all of our hearts. And that you would move us to desire you more and to grow deeper in love with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we jump into Psalm 63, you might be interested to find out that it is one of the most well-loved Psalms of all time, especially for the ancient church. One of the early church fathers, John Chrysostom wrote that it was decreed and ordained by the primitive church fathers that no day should pass without the public singing of this Psalm. He also observed that the spirit and soul of the whole book of Psalms is contracted into this psalm. In, the, in fact, the ancient church used to begin each Sunday service with singing Psalm 63. So I thought maybe we should start right now and sing together. No. Um, so as we, we're going to take a closer look at this psalm and keep in mind the place it's had in church worship for centuries. Now, you'll notice from the text that David penned Psalm 63 when he was in the desert or wilderness of Judah. The text tells, that's what the text says. It's unclear if this took place before he came to the throne while he was being hunted down by King Saul, or whether it was during David's brief exile from the throne during the rebellion of his son Absalom. Either way, he was a man on the run in the wilderness, away from the comforts of home. The desert would have been disorientating for him. Accompanying him was his band of loyal followers. And David would have been under pressure to keep his band safe and to provide essentials like food and water and safety. It was in this context that David comp composed this song of praise to God. He begins his song, Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David gets right down to it, addressing God, 
the God who is his God, whom he knows personally. He needs God. He earnestly seeks God, thirsting for him in his soul, fainting for him in his body. This is a whole person intense yearning for God. David compares it to being in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Now, that analogy might be a little wasted on us in these days of relentless rain. I was thinking maybe as in a dark and gloomy land where there is no sun might be more appropriate. But I did get a sense of the desert a few nights ago. I was dreaming that I was so thirsty that if I didn't get water fast, I would die. And I was so desperate for a drink of water. And it turns out as I came to consciousness that I really was thirsty. So I downed a glass of water and went back to sleep. But it's that kind of thirst that David is talking about. I wonder if you've ever felt that kind of thirst. And then if you think about that in spiritual terms, are you so desperate for God that you are about to faint in your spirit, that you must find him, you need him, you need God to just go on? That's the kind of intense longing and deep desire that David had for God. He could not go on without him. Remember, he's in the middle of the desert, away from all the familiar religious emblems and rituals he would have known. We might say he was away from church, sort of like we are today. So what does he do? Verse two, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. In this desert moment, David takes a moment to remember the experience of looking upon the power and glory of God in the sanctuary or the tabernacle. It is a place where God manifests himself, where he comes and blesses his people. It could also be that he is going to a place of sanctuary in his spirit there in the desert, where he can rest and draw from his experience the memory of who God is. This vision of God's character puts everything in perspective. All his present challenges pale in comparison to the greatness of God. He says in verse 3 and 4, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Here we have this outpouring of praise that exudes not only from David's mouth, but also his hands are lifted high as he calls on God's name. This joyous praise arises because David knows God's love personally. It is the love of God that moves David to praise God. He attests that God's steadfast love is better than life. More than anything else he can desire, more than life itself, it's God's love, it's God's love that is better, better than all. Now let's just pause for a moment and think about that. Have you experienced the steadfast love of God? Can you say that God's love is better than life itself? I was thinking about this comparison and wondering if I could echo David's words. Now, I have known God's love in a variety of ways over the years. I always think of an experience I had when I was um, in deep in despair, studying theology um, in a professor's home that I lived, which made it even more interesting. But I had this experience of God's love enveloping me and pressing down on me like a weighted blanket as I cried out to God on my bed. And that love was powerful and reassuring. But do I know the love of God to the extent that I could say that the love of God is better than life itself? Or is my greatest concern my life, preserving my comforts, staying safe and healthy, enjoying my life, exercising control in my life. How would my heart change if God's love were my greatest desire, more important, more valuable than even my life? I imagine, for one thing, the floodgates would be open, the inhibitions lift, and in my Freedom, I would be praising God with all my, my whole heart, soul, mind, and spirit, strength. 
And I imagine people that would look on would see that and be drawn to it. I would join David in this, his single pursuit of God, of seeking him with all that I am. Now, from time to time, I think it's good to take stock and ask, what is it that I desire? What is it that I truly want? You know, we, we are made to worship. Even Bob Dylan knows that. We are made to worship, to desire, to love with all our hearts. We have longings and hopes that are planted in our, our souls by the living God. How do our desires line up with God's desires for our life? There's nothing like the feeling when our desires overlap with God's desires for us. We are filled with a sense of completeness, wholeness, and a joy in praising God and serving others in the specific ways that he's designed for us. We'll, we will always be tempted to settle for lesser loves, but desiring God above all else will lead us on the path to fullness of life, all that we were meant to be. So it's worth it to take stock now and then and ask that basic religious question, what do I want? What do I desire more than anything? David continues to delight in God as he reflects on what God has done for him. Picking up in verse five, my soul is satisfied as with a rich feast and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. As David seeks God, his soul is satisfied, satiated. It's like the way you feel after a big turkey dinner or a prime rib dinner, anything with a lot of fat. That's kind of the sense you get in this passage. When we eat fat, we're sat satisfied, content. There's a peace that comes when the longing in our hearts is satisfied. If you think of the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha's running around in the kitchen and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary knew this kind of peace and satisfaction when she sat still with Jesus. Joy wells up in us when we sense that peace, that filling deep in our souls. It comes as we give our lives to Jesus when he's first our priority. It is as if we lose our lives. It's, it's when we lose our lives that we truly find life in Jesus. Notice in this psalm that seeking God is not restricted to a certain time of day. Um, sometimes it, we're tempted to think, oh, good. I had that little time with God. I read the scriptures. I prayed a bit. Check that box. Or I went to church on Sunday. Uh, check that box. So I can get on with my life. No, David is is thinking about him throughout the day, seeking him. Throughout the night, while David is lying on his bed, he's meditating on God. Now, I'm sure he could have been strategizing about how he would survive the next day, but instead he chooses to meditate on God. Perhaps he's contemplating the character of God. I have a friend who is working through a book on the attributes of God's character, um, such as God is all powerful, all loving, merciful. He's the provider. He's a counselor, etc. And she told me that it's that doing this, focusing on the attributes of God, has been a great way to deepen her knowledge of God and her prayer life as well. So David used those quiet hours when he wasn't sleeping to meditate on God. Now, one good thing about the pandemic is that it has given us, or at least some of us, more time. I've even heard that some people are bored. Uh, if you found yourself with more time, how are you using it? I know it's hard, but perhaps God is calling you to spend more, more of that time with him, meditating on him, asking God to reveal himself and to speak to you as you read the Bible. Maybe he's calling you to join a couple others in a triad. On January 20th, I believe, there's a meeting for a triad to pray for one another and to encourage one another in growing closer to God. 
Or maybe God is asking you to reach out to your neighbors or work colleagues in some way. A good place to start is to invite God to speak to you as you listen for his voice, even through the watches of the night. David sums up his relationship with God. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. The word cling is the same word that is used um, when a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. It's a gluing together. It's a being united with a strong affection. So David's soul is glued to God. He's united to God and God's right hand upholds him. So as we cling to God, we can depend on God to hold us steady. David ends his song by looking ahead. He knows the end of the story, which gives him strength in his present crisis. In verse nine, but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be prey for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Sometimes we like to skip over these parts of scripture. But God is just, and in the end, he will bring justice to the earth. David anticipates that God will make all things right. God is his defense. God is his righteous judge who will come to judge the earth. Those who seek to kill David will be killed. The mouths of liars will be stopped, silenced music to my ears. More reasons for David to rejoice and to exult in the glory of God. In his present crisis, David is able to see the end of the story. That's a good reminder to us as well. Remembering the end, when Jesus will come and judge the earth, can put our present challenges into perspective. We can remember that justice will prevail and that God will usher in his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Glory be to God. May we see our story, our lives, in the light of his grand narrative. So looking back at this psalm, we see that David is seeking God with all of his heart and is full of praise for God, even in the desert, even under, under these constraints and challenges that he's facing. He's praising God. It's the steadfast love of God that feeds his seeking and motivates this praise of his. So just before I wrap up, I want to revisit this idea of desire. James K.A. Smith wrote a book about how our habits shape us and how they illuminate what it is that we truly desire, what we love. He makes the point that we are what we love. Our desires will shape how we spend our time and what we are devoted to. And it is our desire that will draw us to Jesus and keep us growing in love with him, keep us clinging to him. It is our desire for Jesus that will get us through this challenging time, keeping us seeking Jesus and coming out the other end stronger and more in love with Jesus than ever before. You might ask yourself, what if I don't desire? What if I don't desire Jesus? What if I don't desire Jesus enough? I don't think any of us desire Jesus enough, or we could always desire Jesus more. I think we need to pray and pray that God would woo us to himself, that he would place in us that desire for him and him alone, and that he would let that desire grow deeper and us that we might grow deeper in love with Jesus. So I just want to close by praying that for all of us. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you that you have made a way to God for us possible through your death and resurrection. We thank you for coming to earth and for loving us so much. And thank you for that steadfast love that keeps us going, keeps us praising you. I pray that for all of us, Lord, you would increase our desire for you, that it wouldn't be something we'd have to muster up, but we would sense you building that desire in us 
and that we would respond to that. So we pray your Holy Spirit to come on each of us and do a new work in us to the glory of God and his kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.